So after looking at this uh, picture of Michael on the screen, I said, you know, I don't think anything in this bio is what I really need to say. I think we have more interesting things that he's going to talk about. So I'd just like to very briefly introduce Michael Zida. We're delighted to have him here. He just told me that he makes uh, zillions of dollars at a speaker bureau. I think that was the right note, wasn't it? Just about zillions. exact zillions, zillions of dollars. Speakers International in London. Yes. And I said, we have free coffee. Free coffee. You know, that's we do free coffee, and there might be some muffins she left had, over. She had to get the airline tickets for me to come here from somebody else. Yeah, yeah. But thanks to all of you and to our sponsors, we're all here today, and the lights are still on, so that's good. No. <clears throat> that's the life of a not-for-profit. So Michael is director of the USC Game Pipe Laboratory, and he is also professor of engineering practice in the USC Department of Computer Sciences. And <clears throat> we're not quite sure what engineering practices are, so maybe they just practice engineering, but he'll tell us all about it. So Michael, up to you. Okay, great. So, so There's I a loose mic if you want to. All mics are loose. <laughs> okay, nothing with that. All right. So what's an engineering practice professor? It means I'm in a temp position at USC. And uh, so, so I don't know if you've ever thought this way. On my 50th birthday, I thought, what was the best birthday present I could give myself? I quit my previous job and said, the heck with it. And then decided I, I should look for a job after that. And, and so I went to the Dean of Engineering at USC and I said, hey, why don't you like hire me and I'll build you a games program and uh, it will grow up really big and, and it'll be successful. Why don't you do that? Cause, so I never do anything the right normal way. I just kind of like go the other way. And I, so he gave me a temp position, which is this professor of engineering practice. I'm now at just about four years at USC. Uh, we have a games program that now has 400 students uh, in our classes. If you went to the game industry and said, where is the best place that we can get hires? They would say our program, which didn't exist four years ago. So uh, that's kind of what it, engineering practices. So I'm practicing to like someday do it right. 21 years before that, I was a professor at a school in Monterey, California, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School. I founded the MOVES Institute, the Modeling Virtual Environments and Simulation Institute. I grew that to 70 faculty and staff and 19 million a year in research funding. And at the same time, I directed and built the America's Army game and grew that to almost 4 million registered players. So I built and operated a game from inside a university. I think it's the only time anybody's built a hit game inside of a university, so I do that kind of stuff. Uh, explaining the picture, this is my personal trainer up there. Um, so I still live in Carmel by the Sea on the weekends, and during the week I, I live in Venice, California. So that's in Gold's Gym in Venice. I work out, yes, with Hulk Hogan, The Rock, and my trainer, the fitness queen there. And uh, from nine at mid, nine at night to midnight, and then uh, usually 7, 15, 8 in the morning. So I didn't do my cardio this morning, I just got on the airplane. And we have a nonprofit that we founded called the Fight Against Childhood Obesity. And we have a kids group that tours uh, the world and shows kids fitness on stage and as performance. And she teaches uh, lectures on um, proper diet choices. So you can see what I've been doing the last four years is like speeding along and having fun. All right. So I built a lab at USC called the Game Pipe Laboratory. And the mission of the laboratory is research, development, and education on technologies and design for the future of interactive games and their application from developing the supporting technologies for increasing the complexity and innovation in produced games to developing prototypes, uh, both entertainment and serious games for government and corporate clients. If you went to the game industry four years ago and you said, wow, where do you do your, you know, your R&D? They'd go, what? well, we might do like a really big D and a really small R, but we probably don't do a lot of that. And with, I said, why don't we like build this facility at USC and you can come and get some smart students on it. And most of them said, hey, a new program? You're not going to succeed. Well, we have grown. Um, Degree programs I built in particular, I built a bachelor's in computer science specializing in games and a master's in computer science specializing in game development. I also helped the Dean of Fine Arts create the Game Art and Design Minor program. And then what I did is I linked the, all of the programs at the school together into this final game projects class which takes place in the Game Pipe Lab. So USC has a very distinguished school of cinematic arts and we take the interactive media students who learn how to do game design both at the undergrad and and graduate level and we put them into that class. We take the students from the MFA and the undergraduate program in animation from cinematic arts and we put them in that final game projects class. We put the fine arts students 
into that class and we put the computer science students into that class and then we push blend and, and, and hope it works out. It's kind of interesting experience because you know I've always wanted to take computer scientists and make them work with designers. Uh, just you know it's kind of it's kind of interesting because the very first time they, they take a joint class I get these real interesting responses. I was just sitting in my office and a student will come by and goes, I hate this class and I'll walk away. <laughs> and then he'll come back next week, I hate that class and he'll walk away. And uh, some of them come back, oh this is great. This is a design class, this is great. And then by the end of the semester, the, most of the people who came in said they hate the class, come back and say, this is the best class I ever took in my life. And then uh, the students who still say they hate it on the last day when they graduate, we, we, we send them to Microsoft, okay? <laughs> I, and I, I say that in a very loving fashion, all right? Okay. So, the last. <laughs> You know, it's okay. I, all right, I've probably got some viruses coming in my email any time now. But it's, it's, a, it's a Mac PowerBook, and hopefully that'll be cool. But I just threw random pictures of students in here. Uh, so we put, we do a lot of internships and placements with our students. Uh, in May of 2000, we put 30 of our students into internships and jobs. In fact, in 2007. In fact, in 2006, we, uh, when I started the degree program, I actually talked to Electronic Arts, and they said, we do not recruit anybody from the computer science department at USC. I said, well, that's going to change because I'm going to build you this program. They go, you're not going to make this happen. I said, yeah, it's going to happen. We are now their largest source of computer scientists into EA, which is nice. So we put students into EA, LucasArts, two into Microsoft. I told you that. Um, Activision, Google, Akamai, Sony Computer Entertainment, Disney, 2K Sports, THQ, CNET Networks, Bionic Games. They bought that guy. A, no. No, I'm sorry. Qualcomm, Price Carb, Tactical Language, Neptune Media, they, that company is a little tiny startup. And they, they, they took one of my network game infrastructure guys and said, we'll give you a car. And he goes, what kind of car? He goes, what kind of car do you want? And they hired him and, and started him at, uh, you know, with a master's degree, it's 140000 a year. I'm like, okay, this is good. Our students walk out of here doing well. We do a demo day at the end of every semester. Now this is this is very interesting thing to do. So you basically say all the students you're building games this semester and at the end of the semester you're going to demo your stuff to game industry. Which means a couple things. First of all, they cannot slack off because if they do, that's like a career in, not a career enhancing move. And that also means that they're willing to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week for most of the semester, which is also excellent. And uh, so we have a number of companies that attended in December 2007. You can even notice Creative Artists Agency. That's one of my favorite attendees. CAA represents Tom Hanks, Julia Roberts, people like that in Los Angeles, if you know any of those people. Um, they also have a games division run by Seamus Blackley, and he's got his minions. And his minions have been coming to Demo Day and saying, well, we now rep already represent the known people in the game industry. We want to represent the future leaders. And so they came to that Demo Day. They looked at one of the games the students built, and they grabbed the student team and the game, and they Got, help get a company formed. So they go from like demo day to on Tuesday to having their own company on Monday with funding, which is very nice. Uh, Creative Artists Agency actually came in three weeks ago and are already in discussion with three of our groups uh, before demo day. <laughs> the smarter companies, I guess, do that. Uh, <laughs> they're very happy with us. They, they, they're trying to offer us uh, interesting donations. We have a number of other people that came uh, in May. Uh, tiny companies, big companies, uh, defense contractors, um, film production companies, special effects companies, national laboratories, um, other venture capital companies come. They want to see our students. So our biggest product is students, but we also do research and development, and that program is growing quickly. Um, a lot of what we're doing has is, is been in network games, and of course network games and online games are, are really big. Companies come to me and go, where can we get students who know how to build network game infrastructures? And I said, well, we actually teach a class on network games. I teach it, actually. We also te I also teach a networked AI class and a mobile games class, which is kind of fun. Um, here's a group of students from that class. And there are a lot of government people very interested in network and online games, which, you know, for you in industry, maybe you don't care. NASA is trying to build a game 
They call it a STEM game. Whenever you see the word STEM, what that usually means is they're worried about none of our kids are going into science, technology, engineering, or math, and they want to figure out how to do it. So, so they look at me, they always look at me and say, well, you built the America's Army game, which uh, dramatically improved the US Army's recruiting. Can we build a game that encourages kids to go follow careers in space for NASA? I said, sure. Just fund this project. Uh, Department of Homeland Security is also interested in where do they get uh, next generation things. There's, there's a problem in government in that um, we've had a 70% drop in people going into engineering and competing careers and the U.S. government is getting it, whose salaries are way lower than private industry is getting hit pretty dramatically about not having a next generation pipeline of people going into uh, working for them. Uh, DARPA is interested in how do you do take online games and analyze what's going on in them, as is Sandy, as is Office of Naval Research. So uh, we've been building our own online game infrastructure to play with because, frankly, the people at Blizzard are not yet ready to turn us over their crown jewels. And I don't think they ever will be. And uh, they won't even come give a talk. We hope someday they will. Um, we've been looking a lot at behavioral models and online games. These are models that watch game play and then play back. And it turns out in the US government, there are quite a few behavioral models. This is a crazy picture. I just kind of like draw these pictures. This is how it should look. And in here I call it a social model. But there are a lot of models built by sociologists, anthropologists, economists that go off and say, well, if this happens and you've got these inputs, this will happen. And the US government looks at those and says, ah, how do we see if those make any sense? And so we've been building an online game test bed so you can go test those out with people playing uh, in a game. And we're also looking at how do you build believable agent populations. And this is, this is a really fun project. This is how do you take online information feeds off the internet, plug them into the game, and then have the autonomous characters in the game have different behaviors today because the stock market is different. Okay, stock market's down a little bit today. You'd like your characters a little bit cranky in the game as you play against them. Stock market's going way up. You'd like them a little bit happier and from more, more friendly with you before they shoot you. All right. Uh, there's also this notion of how can you model a culture as a group? So they read something in the newspaper today that is something that is maybe important for that group and we put it in there and that particular group's behaviors are different in the online game today. So you look at Madden 2008, Madden had weather in it. And you could read today's weather, you're playing in Tampa Bay, we know it's going to have a thunderstorm some part of the day and uh, so that's in there. But we're thinking about other things, economic models, uh, news items and we're, we're toying around and playing with that. This is research. This is stuff you're never going to see a game industry playing with, I think, until we say, yeah, this is a good thing. And this is kind of like the extension from that. I, this is a project we have called the Grass World which is you take real-time streams from the internet and real-time sensors off the internet and you plug them into the multiple uh, behavioral and physical models. So in fact, the first one we're looking at is how do you build an agent-based model of, eco of the economy such that you could do incident response to potentially bad days in the economy? So we're doing a lot of very interesting reading. This, you know, this, is, this is not just computer science. It's not just games. It reaches out to grab the modelers from the social sciences as well. And if you, think of, if you try and think of this as, what if I had something that was like a real-time SimCity model in here that I could actually then give you some visual displays of what today looks like, we think, and then maybe change some policies and say, well, if we change some policies, what would that also then look like? And so you could see the dot, 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 meaning we could try this with multiple displays. This is research, okay. This will lead to really interesting games in the future. We also do a lot of thinking about human emotion, uh, human aware computing, emotion cognizant games. And probably all of you have no realized that you can now go out and get a hybrid EEG sensor uh, for uh, 300 bucks or less. Uh, there are multiple companies in this business. You've got Emotive, and you've got Neuroscan, you've got MSense, and these companies make sensors that uh, are very low cost that can actually give you a distilled human state vector. You know, is this person happy or sad? Are they upset? Are they angry? Are they not understanding the game? Have they lost the focus in the game? 
are they making a guess at that multiple choice answer as opposed to really knowing the material? That's my favorite, you know, being a professor. Because, like, you know, they're getting the right answer, but they're guessing. <laughs> so we can grade them differently than it, as if we didn't know they were guessing. Um, I like that. So there's a couple of you think about teaching. Uh, if you have this technology, and everyone right now is trying to make this in entertainment, but this is the fundamental technology for individual education. So if you can make an, a brain sensor for $25, fit it in a headband, and get kids to wear it while they go off and do online games uh, that are emotion cognizant, then we can do very interesting things there. And so we're thinking a lot about that. We've been working with MSense, uh, which is in San Francisco. Um, someone asked me about economy, MSense, I think, had 20 employees in September, and they had 40 employees in October, and they're online to get 80 employees by January. So even, even in this weird economy, this company is zooming. Um, I'll stop there. Human-aware computing, games for fitness and preventive health. This is, this is of course, the Nintendo Wii uh, is huge. The Dance Dance Revolution before that. All of these movement-enhancing games are great. Um, if you're into, you know, so there's sort of two varieties here. You would like to have things to do pr to promote fitness and preventive health. The Nike iPod sports kit. The, uh, there's starting to be a lot of very interesting sensor-based things that you can do. Some of our funding uh, recently has been with a very large health insurance company, Humana, which is very in interested in sensor-based games that get you out into the real world with a mobile game and a sensor embedded in the mobile phone that, uh, you know, as you go running around in the world, uh, it, it can tell if you are running or walking or riding a bicycle or jumping or if you're in a car or if you stuck the phone in a blender or a paint shaker. Um, and they want to know that. And then because you went off and did cardio today, uh, you're going to have uh, your virtual character on your mobile phone is going to be happier, all right? So we actually uh, built a prototype of that. Welcome to the general introduction oh, of PetPal. Pet Pal. PetPal is an active health game which involves a virtual pet avatar that you have to take care of on a daily basis. You basically have to feed the pet, exercise him, and play with the pet. And then in the midst of it all, you have a whole bunch of tricks, uh, mini games. To I'm going to speed it up a little bit just so you can see the, uh, the, the part where you're running around. You have to pet the guy. You've got to feed him. And you've got to, you've got to go off and do your, your personal cardio today, just the food part. And we don't have a lot of time to go through all of this. OK, here we go. OK, so if you're running around, your dog is running around. <laughs> this, is, this is the kid. He's going yeah, to get on the bicycle. And as soon as he starts bicycling, the dog gets on the bicycle. Right. We're working on the false positive detection. We believe we've got a very good algorithm for it. So we're riding in the building, you know. So we didn't get the dean here. Anyway, this is kind of a cool little game. We, you know, so I'll tell you a little bit. We built this for this health insurance company, Humana, and they love it. And so we're looking at, we're, we're, we're in process of uh, uh, running, we filed two patents right. on this technology. And we're running down the road towards commercial, commercializing it. We have, uh, I think, uh, no fewer than three companies interested in helping us get there. So this is, again, student-built technology. Uh, and the way we got there is this PhD student, his summers are spent at EA Mobile. In this section, we demo on how and we I'm make gonna, it. And I'll just leave that on for a second there. So what I'm doing with students as I get them up to a particular point, and when their summers come, I push them off into industry. Then I bring them back in and have them continue to work on their PhD topic. And then I push them out to industry, and we build real stuff that looks really good. All right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push ahead. Um, what time we got? I'm going to show you some other demos of games off of our student DVD. Uh, and I'll talk, I'll talk through them as we go along here, because I know that's more interesting to you than PowerPoint. All right. It's got to wake up the uh, DVD here. It's gone to sleep on me. Beginning of disc. This, this, I don't know why I did this. It makes you blurry eyes. That's probably how I was feeling when I did it. All right. So our students build I hope this. Hold on. Oh, here we go. So we tell our students together a design, put together a team, and make a game that's completely different. 
than other games that are out there in the real world. So these, these, these students decided we're going to take this uh, groundhog guy and he's going to go just blow up buildings. And the input device is a Wiimote, runs on a PC. Our students love hacked technology. As soon as they could get the Wiimote on a PC, they did it. As soon as they could get that hacked Nintendo DS kit, they made their own Nintendo games. Uh, before we could get the Apple iPhone, we were all building you know, jailbroken games. Um, students are very creative and they do very interesting things. I'm going to skip this ahead. I asked the student how fast he could play this. I mean, this is like a... You should turn the sound up on the games a little bit. Thank you. It's called Trembler. He's making an iPhone version of this now. And so you just go, so, you know, if you're thinking a young man, and he like this kind of game, of course. Let's go blow crap up. This is the first demo level, and then the next level, we'll just blow more stuff up. Next level, we'll blow more stuff up. All right. So if you give students, you know, this is not Spider-Man 5, right? Although I have students who worked on Spider-Man 3 and Call of Duty 5. OK, this is foul play. Had I known this was a pigeon pooping game at the start, where the idea is you have to go poop on people and steal food from the homeless guy, and then this is so the woman who designed this is very interesting. She's an undergraduate in industrial and systems engineering. She designed all the art, did all the art, all the modeling. She's a very interesting person. Uh, her summer job was not in the game industry, but doing like uh, nonlinear programming and optimization stuff. And uh, she finally decided she really wants to go off and do something different. She's making an iPhone version of this game. I want to tell you, everybody wants to make an iPhone game now. This is the most compelling platform. I'll leave this on later. It's kind of fun. I'll leave this. Oh, you know that, that's that's when you're you, you want to you gonna steal some eggs and stuff. All right. Oh, we got some trash can food here. We're gonna get. All right. We got the hot dog. I think the homeless guy is running around here somewhere. There he is. He's over there by the trash can. This is not politically correct game. This is, you know, I... Okay. So when we, when we show this, I have to tell you about this woman because we built it in our game degree program. We built an online asset system where you could go and put all of your models, but you can also see all of the other models from all the other games that are being built. So further on in the game, she, you have to actually go and crap on all of the other projects that were being built that semester. That's very, you know, she's, a, she's very interesting. All right. This is Skydye. Skydye is a number of Indian students who really like uh, kite fighting. And they decided, again, to use the Wii mode as input devices to be the, the kite strings. Um, they used, in the next, gen, next version of this, which this is not, uh, they use the Havoc physics engine for the string modeling and are doing some very, very cool things uh, with it. And I believe they're also making an iPhone version. <laughs> this is pretty funny. But uh, a very peaceful game. Uh, you get to fly a kite, you get to bring another kite in and cut the strings and the whole bit that you do with, with flying kites. And we also work with the School of Music. Uh, we go over to the composing program and the uh, film scoring program and uh, get those students to design music for all of our games, which is pretty interesting. We ha I have music competitions. Okay, here's Ragnarok. I'll put this one on. Um, this is they learn how to hack the Guitar Hero guitar and plug it into a PC and use it as an input device. And they decide they're going to build their own game on it. Yeah, because you can't go to any of these companies and say, why don't you make an open interface so that our students can play and do something cool and creative with this. They don't do that. So the internet, lots of creative stuff. I mean, the fun part about this is the artist drew this comic. They had a composer do the music. They went and built their own gameplay. And this is the you know intro scene to the game. I'll leave it on because it's quite interesting.
this is that uh, you play in one part of the game and then you skip the rest of your life. But it's a beautiful comment. Uh, the kid who was the artist who did this is very talented. He didn't say anything all semester. He just drew the comic and pop. It was very interesting. He had like the flu and bronchitis the whole term. Um, anyway, I'll just leave this on a little bit. So your input device is a guitar with a guitar. And it's very strange because they made it. You have to do all these weird movements and button pushes and to fight the monsters. And every once in a while, you just kind of have to break out in song. So, I mean, what's interesting is, is our students are creating these very strange play mechanics that are very different. And to me, it's, it's a blast. Demo day is a total blast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of leave that on. I'm going to turn the sound off, and we'll ask questions at this point, because I know we're at 35, 36 minutes, and we should do about four or five minutes of questions. So any questions? Yes, sir. How do you do the licensing of the intellectual property for the games? I know that at places like MIT and Stanford have a very difficult time doing exclusive deals. OK, so, so, so we did a really good thing. And I think you're going to like this. We uh, let the students own all the intellectual property for everything they build in the class, unencumbered by the university, all right? And, and I will tell you. This, this is what universities should do. Why should they do that? Because the students will then give you their best game design. They will work their heart out. They know that there's people in the audience on demo day who can potentially license it and get them a career. And what's important to me, I, you know, is I'm at that you know, stage in life. My home in Carmel by the Sea is nine blocks from the beach and it's paid off. You know, if this temp job doesn't work out, I can just go back and work in the tourist industry. It's kind of my thought. Um, <laughs> So, 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 so the attitude was, what, what's a value to a professor in the long term? What's a value is you want to see your, your kids, your kids, they're 22 years old, 24 years old, to go off in the industry and do something great and come back. So, you know, one of my former students is the president of Epic Games, Mike Capps, uh, came out with Gears of War and Gears of War II. Uh, it's pretty good for a PhD, former PhD student. Uh, we have, uh, I have two students on uh, uh, Call of Duty uh, Worlds at War that just came out. They were on Spider-Man 3 as well. Uh, pretty much, if you go off into the game industry, they're doing exciting and fantastic things. One of my former PhD students is designing the, the entire microtransaction system for EA Mobile um, games. So what's important for me? That they become rich. Okay, and that they come back and donate a building to the USC Game Pie program. I mean, that's what I really like. But the real, real truth is, is, is you know, when I when I turn uh, 60 years old, I would like to have a, a bunch of students come back and have a big party. That's the goal. All right. So no, I don't need to own the IP. Other questions? I was wondering if your network gaming environment uh, leverages peer-to-peer -peer computing, or you don't see that as playing a role. Um, because of lots of reasons that surround peer-to-peer -peer computing? Well, you know, they ask a good question. Um, if you go into industry, they don't do peer-to-peer -peer much right now. Uh, they do a lot of client server, so we teach them how to do that. But we also teach them peer-to-peer. -peer. You, you realize that uh, I'm, I'm, ri I'm writing a book called Network Games, Design and Implementation. My co-author is a guy named, named Sandeep Singhal. Do you know Sandeep? Uh, if you went to Microsoft, he is the director for networking for the Windows operating system, and uh, he has done probably almost all of their peer-to-peer -peer research in his group. So, yeah, I don't think we can leave it out of the book. I don't think we can leave it out of the class. Uh, the goal is to, to give the students an understanding of, um, uh, yeah, it's the old earlier version of PetPal, give them an understanding of how to go and design such infrastructures so that they can go and make them happen. All right. There are, no, there are no limits to that. So we don't try and limit them in creative end or in the, you know, in the engineering end as well. Other I'm afraid questions? we're going to have to stop there, right. but Michael has promised that he will stay during the break, I hope, yes, and collect cards then. And we'll have to call our panel up so that uh, we can try to stay on time. Thank you so much, Michael. Oh, That's great. Thank you, for, thank you for inviting me. With that, I'd like to call our next panel up uh, and our moderator, Lisa.
I didn't do that. All right. 